Father, thank you for your awesome grace. You're already here. Your glory is here. Your glory is in us. Your presence is in every single one of us. We came in with you. We walked in with you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have your absolute way. You give us revelation of your amazing face, of your magnificence, of your glory. We, we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name. Wonderful God. Wonderful God. Jesus is so good. He's so amazing. Um, I'm going to just dive into something that, that um, I was reading the word and looking at the sun turn into darkness and the moon into blood in that great, when the great day of the Lord shall come. And you read lots of scriptures. Um, it's in uh, Isaiah. It's in Revelations. It's in Matthew. It's so many, so many talk about the day of the Lord. And when you look it up, and it says the sun will turn to darkness. Other scriptures say the sun won't shine. And it's like when in the day of the Lord's return. And it finally dawned on me. The reason why the sun, because I used to think, does, will the sun actually be dark? Well, you know, what's going to happen and all that. It's actually the, the, the fact that when Jesus comes back to this planet, his face shines so bright that the sun will seem like it's gone dark. I'm convinced that's what it is. The glory of our Jesus, when he comes back to this planet, you know, if I had a, if I had a, if I had a light and then a floodlight, that light that's in front, if that's not on, you'll see it. But once I turn that on, you won't see it anymore. That's what's going to happen to our son because of the glory of the face of Jesus. And we worship him. There's a couple of things I want to just say. I had, a, had a, a, a picture and an image, and I think it's a word of wisdom, maybe for one or two people. It might be collectively. I mean, it's always collectively. We can also apply it. But I had a picture of a funny thing. Um, just, it just flashed in my spirit when I was meditating, and I saw a helicopter, and I saw a geese fall out of the helicopter on its face. You know, like Donald Duck, whenever he used to fall, and it's like on his face, and, and I just, it was a blink of an eye, it was a blink, and I thought, what's that? A helicopter? It's a vehicle that moves. But this geese fell out of it and fell on its face. And I know geese are designed to fly in V formation, and they fly in groups, and they migrate that way. And I looked it up and all that, and they migrate for hundreds and hundreds of miles when the one on the front takes the, take the, takes the resistance of the wind, and the others, they, they rest. It's easier for them, and they all take turns. When one's tired at the front, they go back and they can go for hundreds of miles. And if one falls out of formation, they can't, they can't go for hundreds of miles. And this one says, you know, are, are we uh, uh, something like a, a geese wiser than us? You know, like we should, we should take note from that. So you know, I think it's just God saying, don't try to do something on your own. You know, and V formation and, and migration. It could even be when we, you know, let's just trust God to plant churches with this, this V formation with this togetherness, with this oneness, with when we go and obey God, you know. Um, I had a little, another little picture of a hippo. This is another funny one. A hippo just lying down, sleeping on its back. And I thought about that. I just thought hippos are dangerous and they're powerful. And they're the most dangerous animal in South Africa. And they fight for their territory, don't they? But they've got to be on their full feet. And it's like God's saying, God's flipping us, South Africa, around. And, you know, there's some, maybe it's for one or two people that you, you are powerful, way more than you know it. I, I, I you know, on the flight here, I thought the Lord said, just stir me about, about, the, about the power of God and miracles and signs and wonders. And we need, we need to see that just normal lifestyle. And the Lord said, just look, do, I do Strong's Concordance, you know, put up the word power. And all the scriptures come up in my New Testament on, on power. Just go through one by one. Almost, I haven't even finished yet. But just go through one. There's so many of them. The dunamis power of God. And it just, so much, it just stirs my spirit to say, God, we need to see that to become normal on every believer. Not just the great apostle, pastor, prophet, you know, the evangelist. They have to equip us to do the works. Amen. When I first became a, uh, when, I, when I first partnered with the team, God was so good to us because we started in 1990. I was 22 years old. I got saved at 19, so I knew nothing of biblical blueprint. I knew nothing on how to build. I knew nothing on how to do church. I just had passion for Jesus, in love with Jesus, got radically saved from a hip-hop, breakdancing scene, nightclubbing, drinking, and I got saved at 19. 
three years in the Lord and the Lord said, go plant. And I, and I planted no training, nothing. But God was gracious because God spoke to Dudley in 1989 and went to Adelaide. And we met, uh, I heard of him for the first time, I think in 92. So the church had been going for two years. And I'm the first one to admit that if we didn't connect with the team, I'm telling you straight out, I know 100% that I would have, I would have burnt out. I would have been a statistic because I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I would have built everything in my own strength because I, I didn't know. I didn't have the time. You know, you're trying to build. You're trying to find out how to do it. Well, I, I would have done it on my own and I would have messed up badly. I know it. So I know it's by God's grace that we, we were able to partner with the team. And over the years, it's taken many, many, many years and still going to take many more years to, to grasp what it means to build biblically. And I, I, so I'm going, to do my, I'm going to do my absolute best to dive into this. If you've got your Bible, see Ephesians chapter 4. Um, all right. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is a great master builder. He said that about himself. And he wrote an amazing book in, 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 or letter in Ephesians. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 says, All that we are in Christ. We, 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 we have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know the fact that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are made alive with him. We, we were dead with him, but he made us alive. He raised us up with him in heavenly places. He made us to sit with him in heavenly places. The Bible even says that if we sat with him, we also are glorified with him. And that's past tense, by the way. So that's spiritually, every single spiritual blessing in heavenly places already belongs to you. It's actually already mine. I've just got to get a revelation that it's mine and, and then learn how to lean in to what's already mine. And you can only apply it by faith. You only receive what God has given you by faith. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, basically Paul is saying, um, Therefore, I, as a prisoner of the Lord, I implore you, I beg you to walk worthy, to walk in a, way, in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In other words, because you've been called, what's this calling? It's, it's the invitation that we just read, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. This invitation that you've been invited into heavenly places to sit down at the right hand of the Father in Christ. The whole body of Christ is actually seated with Christ. He's the head, we're the body. We have to be together. We have to see ourselves that we're actually with Christ. Christ didn't do it for himself. He did it to raise humanity back up to an uh, intimate love relationship with the Father. That we have access to the Father. I'm learning more and more. I'm thinking, God, there's, there's absolutely nothing in the way between me and you. There's nothing. Unless I believe there is. Not even my sins in the way. Because I can confess my sins and He is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I was experiencing God's presence the other day, walking in my, around the park, and the presence of God was hitting me, and I'm, I'm just weeping. I, I, I sort of react a lot of times to God's presence, and I weep a lot, uh, maybe because I'm Italian, but I, I cry, and I feel His presence, and, I, and, and, I'm, I, and I, I, don't, I don't always weep. Sometimes I can feel His presence without any crying, no emotions involved at all, and I can feel His presence. So I know how to feel and sense His presence without any weeping. I can weep in my spirit without weeping my emotions. You can too. So you can just, it's yielding anyway. It's that, that beautiful brokenness, that beautiful surrender. And I remember thinking of um, heaven, I think, and I was sort of saying to God, God, I, I want to experience you as if I was in heaven. Like as if I'm in the throne. The Bible does say you come boldly before the throne of his grace to obtain mercy and grace in time of need. I said, like, Lord, I want to experience your glory as if I was there. And then my first reaction was, oh, but you can't because you're in the flesh. I mean, you can't, and then other thoughts came, mindset came, because, uh, because of these demons, and in heaven there's no demons that to ever affect us, but here there are demons, and so I started thinking, hang on a second, is that right thinking? Can demons, fallen angels that have fallen here on this earth, can they affect me experiencing the presence of God? Is the blood of Jesus more powerful than a demon? Now, if I believe that a demon can affect me, guess what it'll do? It'll affect me. But if I believe that Jesus' blood was so powerful that you and I can experience His presence. Why is it we experience His presence when we're engaged, when we have faith, when we are broken, when we're humbling ourselves, when we surrender? It's because we are putting our focus and our faith and our attention on Him and we experience His presence. But it's a mindset. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, but I want us to know everything we learn from the Word on how to build 
people, how to build a church, how to, how to build, when I say, you know, I'm trying to be like, the word is architect. We, you know, it's every part of the body builds itself up. But we have to do it a biblical way. We have to do it God's way. When you do it our way, and we do it with our own strength, we always fail. And there was always judgment, and, and it was also the wineskin always spills and makes a mess, and people get hurt. And we've seen that in church life for many, many times. But here it says, it gives us a powerful key. Paul says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance to one another in love, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Diligent, be diligent to preserve the unity, the oneness, to, the unity is to be made one, the oneness of the Spirit in the bond of being made one. That's what, what the word peace means. The fact that we are one. Do you see yourself as one? I'm not talking about, oh, if you belong to the same group, or same network, same church, same denomination. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Like how God views His body. If someone's born again, they, 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 they repented of their sins and they're born again from above. They're, got, they're a new creation. The Spirit of God has birthed their dead spirit and made it alive. Now they're alive with God. God sees that, that person is a part of my spiritual body of Christ worldwide. Doesn't matter what tag they have or what they name themselves as, this is what I am. I'm Anglican, I'm a Baptist, I'm a this. It's if you truly got born again, God sees one body. And I think we have to see one body. And the key for us to see one, I think it's a key to flow in the fivefold ministry. It's like the fivefold ministry won't activate in its fullness unless we see that. Because it actually says there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in you all. It's like, get it through our heads that there's only one. You can only belong to the one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism. True? We all believe that. And then it says, but, I love that, but to each, every, to each one of us, grace, graces, was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, but to each one of us, the grace that's on you is completely different to someone else. There's differences in our gifts and our grace to each one of us, each person in this room, but grace is given to us. Then it also talks about the fivefold ministry gifts are completely different to each other. It starts to refer to that. In other words, there's one Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism. But remember, the fivefold ministry that Jesus gives is to equip the saints. But the fivefold ministry is, it's like Jesus breaking up himself. Jesus is the greatest apostle, greatest prophet, greatest pastor, greatest evangelist, greatest teacher. And he broke himself up to give gifts to men to point everyone to Jesus. The ministry of every fivefold ministry is not to point people to themselves, but to point people and grow people unto Christ. Their whole ministry, revelation is to unto Christ. And so, it says, let's pick it up from Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. Now, I know a lot of us, especially in South Africa, you guys have, you know, the, the, the foundation's here for 40-something years. And so just because I know a scripture doesn't mean I'm applying the scripture. Just because I know the word and I know the scripture doesn't mean I'm living it. Like I know about laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't mean I see that all the time. I know it, but I've got to have faith to apply that. And even with this, we can know something and not get the fullness of the rev not get the fullness of the benefit until we practice it. Now I'll try to explain what I mean. I've seen, you know, when I go to India, I see, you know, certain villages, especially in the villages, because less people go to the villages, most people go to the cities, and you know, in the villages, usually people, the, the congregation, are exposed to that one pastor. And that one pastor has 30, 40, sometimes 50 churches. But the, the majority of their receiving and input is one pastor. And I'm telling you, I've never seen mature saints in those, in those contexts. They don't, they don't grow up. Because it doesn't matter if you're the greatest pastor in the whole world. It doesn't matter if you're the most anointed pastor in the whole world. If you only receive from that one pastor, you cannot grow up unto Christ. Because it's not God's model, it's not God's pattern, God's pattern or God's blueprint. And you can be the greatest teacher. And you say, well, Leo, you, I listen to the greatest teacher. And it doesn't matter if you listen to the greatest teacher on the planet, if you only listen to him and receive him and, and receive ministry from him only, you still won't grow up in, unto Christ properly. It just won't work. We've seen it happen 
for many, many years. So, so, so we can go on and on to every single one of us, evangelists, greatest evangelists in the world, signs, wonders, miracles, and he might be powerful. But if you only receive from that one person, you're still not going to grow up into Christ. Because God said all five-fold ministry together. And so, so it also says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says that, that the church is built upon, you know this, the, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. If you know a bit of the history of the church, you know, in the 70s and 80s, man, no one believed in apostles. Apostles are dead. They're gone. Twelve of them, they were the only apostles, and that's it. Yet the Bible, the New Testament, speaks of apostles way more than pastors. And not just the 12 apostles, other apostles in the scriptures that you read. So God, you know, if, if apostles were dead and gone, 12 of them, and there's no more apostles today, then how is the church best to mature? If Jesus said the way, the blueprint is to use apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. Now we build on the foundation of the apostles that laid the foundation with Jesus. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We build on that foundation. But there are apostles today, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you, you, not hardly anybody believed in it. So what I'm saying is the revelation started to come into the body worldwide, globally, started to come, started to, and it's still coming more and more. The prophet, too, no one, the prophets, there's no prophets today in the 70s and 80s. The great revelation of prophets and prophets rising up to become prophets was coming into the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and it's still coming into maturity, and we'll see more of it. We believed in pastors. Yes, there's pastors. Yes, there's teachers. And we believed in evangelists. But, you know, you go back 400 years, people believed that you couldn't get saved unless God willed for you to be saved. They didn't believe in whosoever wills, whosoever believes. There's a lot of scriptures about that. But anyway, what I'm saying is we're coming into revelation, coming into more revelation, more revelation. And, and now we're coming into a mature, I believe we're more and more God's bringing the church worldwide into a maturity. What happens also when God did raise up great evangelists or great teachers or great you know, gifted people, like John Wesley, a great evangelist, and then they camped around that one person, didn't they? They made a denomination out of it, Methodists. That's our level of maturity. You know, um, William Booth, another great evangelist, and we made a denomination out of it. And so what happens is you camp around that one gift and say, how are you supposed to mature? You're not, you're not going to. I'm just trying to help us see that we're, we're, we're maturing, we're growing, but even now in our ranks, we need to know how to, if you're leading a church, you, if you just have your friends come in, for example, then you're not going to build the right way. Well, I like this guy. I just love the way he preaches. And you only have that guy in, or you might just have an evangelist in, or you, or you, have, you have always have pastors in, but you don't have all the others. You actually won't know how to grow your church well. You actually need to partner with guys. And it's, it does seasonally change. Um, I, you know, just being in Cape Town, and GJ from Holland was talking about how they you know, they make sure they pray as elders to find out which team guy they need in that season. But when they invite that team guy in, they'll invite him for years, build a partnership with the church and spend time with the whole church, you know, from Monday to Sunday with every single leaders and all that. Why? To, to do the best out of this scripture, to get, get the, uh, the apostles or the pastor, the evangelist teacher to impart. What, what, they, what do they do? Let's have a quick read. I know we know this, but let's have a look. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers for the equipping of the saints. It's not for them to do all the ministry, it's for them to equip the saints. It's, it's, and, and they're the only ones that are going to be able to equip, equip the saints. We, we think, we, you know, we, we've done this for many, many years. The evangelists came in, they did all the evangelizing and no one got equipped. But now, most people around the world are starting to realize, now the evangelist is to equip the saints to evangelize. So that everyone can evangelize. So really, we need evangelists to come in into our ranks until everyone knows how to evangelize. Prophets come in, not so they can all prophesy and wow everybody, but actually teach others how to prophesy. Paul says, it's good that we all prophesy. But they are to impart that gift so that every believer can prophesy. prophesy. And that's growing up into Christ, see? And as my emphasis, and I hope you hear the heart, is that the priesthood of all believers. And again, we can talk about the priesthood of all believers, but if only a few are doing most of the ministry, then we're still just attending church. And we're consumer. Like in, in the West, we fight the consumer attitude all the time. Because people come in, they just want to consume. They expect to consume. They expect to come and receive. And, um, and that's how they shop. They shop church. They do shop church. Church shopping, is it? 
and, they, and they, then they expect, and so now, okay, I'm, I'm a consumer, not an employer. No, we're all employed by the king. Everyone's employed by the king according to the word of God. So we've got to train them and equip them that you're actually employed by the king. And our, all our ministry, this is the place of equipping, our ministry is in the marketplace. Leaders in the marketplace, business people in the marketplace, influencing our world. Because we're all priests. We all carry his presence. We can fly in the gifts out in the streets, out in the workplace, in the universities, at shops. While you're shopping, while you do groceries, we can flow in the gifts. Usually better than in church. Because they're so open. They're so hungry. So, so the other thing that we've also struggled with uh, apostle, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, is they're completely, they're completely different creatures. You know what I'm saying? Go, apostles govern, and they, they focus on a particular, they focus on foundation, but, but the prophets, come on, let's, let's just encounter God, and let's bring guidance. They teach, you know, like they just, let's, let's, we, we need to touch God, and God needs to come here and, and touch us, and, and the evangelists, what are we doing sitting around? Shepherding and caring one another and loving one another and having connect groups and Bible studies because that's needed. But the evangelist wants to say, let's get out there. He gets upset with the pastor. He says, we've got to shepherd them. And the teacher says, we need the word. And we, we, we end up competing with one another rather than completing one another. We're not in competition. We're, in com- we're to complete one another, to fly in formation, to make it easier for everyone. But we've done that, and so I think we've grown up to a maturity to realize, and the revelation that Paul taught in Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 was body, body ministry. You know the body. Jesus is the head, but just like your body has many parts, but every part is not the same function, but it's all one body, so it is with Christ. My liver can't do what the kidney does. My kidney can't do what the spleen does. My, my eyes should not get frustrated. It can't hear. It's not designed to hear. It's designed to see. My ears don't get frustrated because he can't see. But we do that to each other because we, we've got to grow up in maturity. When we grow up in maturity, when someone flows in a particular gift, you go, wow, you, thank you, Lord. We need that in the body of Christ. That's just not me. I don't flow like that. I can't see that. But we need that. And we learn and grow from that. So keep that in your mind because I think it's really, really important. That's how, that's how all these gifts flow together when you actually realize, remember, one Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism. Because we miss out when we, when we create division. When we create schisms in the body, divisions in the body, based on, look what it says here, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the, so the, the saints can do the work of service, not these great fivefold ministry doing it. No, they are to equip the saints for the work of service, equipping the saints so they can do the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. When every believer is doing it, the work of service, when they're equipped, doing the work of service, the body of Christ is built up until we all attain to the unity of the faith. I believe the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? That means we're going to come to a place where we come into the unity of the faith. That's called maturity. And the unity of the faith is not the unity of methodology. We have divided ourselves on methodology, so much so. We've divided ourselves on personality of churches, of expressions of worship in churches. It's not the unity of the faith. You can have a completely different expression in worship and still have the unity of the faith but we fight we fought over the littlest things i mean through covid we had big lessons didn't we to wear the mask or not wear the mask to have the vaccine not to have vaccine and people get divided on those issues and the devil devil loves it he goes i got him again that they're not being united on the unity of the faith romans 14 talks about just let everyone be fully persuaded in your own mind stop judging one another give them the freedom to have a relationship with the lord what God says to you, don't start putting it on them. And anyway, just, we, we're learning, aren't we, globally? We're learning. I believe we're maturing. We're growing up. But the unity of the faith is not even the unity of culture. I'm not talking about kingdom culture, but culture. You go to India, completely different culture, the way they worship. But they worship the same king, same Jesus, same gospel, same baptism, same Lord, same faith. But I don't get frustrated and upset. How come the, and I don't try to teach them, hey, do this. This is what we do. That's just culture. Same with South Africa. It's a different culture. But that, that, that never divide us. We want to be united in kingdom culture, absolutely. But we're not talking about the cultures of this world. Don't let that divide us. All right, you with me? The unity of the faith 
uh, and to all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, you might see this scripture as the knowledge of the Son of God as Jesus. And that's, that's okay. It, it does mean that. But I, I look it up and I look up the, read, the, the word and it talks about full discernment. Until we all come into full discernment of sons of God. That's what it says. I believe it's actually referring to the fact that we come into full discernment that we're sons and daughters of God. That's the maturity that Christ is trying to bring us into, that we are sons of God just like He is. It's maturing us into that. Then it goes on to say, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's our destiny, to be conformed to the image of His Son. So all these gifts is to bring us to become more like Jesus, every single one of us. And until we have all these gifts operating, it's not going to happen the way God wants it to happen. It's not going to be as fast anyway. And there'll be a lot of spillage, there'll be a lot of hurt, there'll be a lot of carnage, there'll be a lot of pain, and we've seen it. A church that's not built biblically, we're talking about blueprint, I asked myself, what is blueprint? Like, what is blueprint? Like, what's a wineskin? You know, Jesus says, you can't put new wine in an old wineskin. An old wineskin is a leather bag made of animal skin that has done all its stretching it can. Even if you put oil, you put oil all over it to soften and everything, but eventually it's because it's, the wine goes in, it ferments, and it grows that bottle. And eventually it can, can't do any more. And so it becomes old and rigid. And Jesus says, you don't put a new wine, because new wine has to grow, ferment. You don't put new wine in an old wine skin, or else it bursts and everything spills. Waste of the new wine. The new wine is to get the wine to the people, isn't it? And so, so we've, got, we've got to put new wine in wine, new wine skin. But, so the wine skin we have is, is a biblical one. It's, it's changing because we're talking about 2,000 years ago to now, and we went through the dark ages, and revelation upon revelation is coming back. You know, through COVID, I don't know about in South Africa, it's probably similar to here, to Australia. Um, you know, people were saying, oh, what's the church going to be when they go back? What's the church going to be when we get out of lockdown? We, we were in lockdown for four months at one period, and three months another, the last year before that. And, and um, you know, what's the church going to look like? And it's like, yeah, well, let's not go back to the norm. Let's not go back to what we were doing. Let's not go back. Let's do something different. You know, it's almost like, let's be different for the sake of difference. Let's be changed and all that stuff. And one lady, pro- prophetess from another movement altogether, and God's doing this around the world. But she started prophesying, this is what I believe the church is going to look like. And it sounded like a, it sounded, everyone else, you can tell the way they were interpreting, it was like a new language. But like, wow, that sounds radical. And all she was saying was a biblical model of, um, basically she was saying, um, you know, that the church would, would flow with the Holy Spirit and not be organizational, but be organic with life of God. And, and, there were, and the members would be activated 24-7 in the marketplace. And the priesthood of everyone carrying the presence of God and everyone being priests. And she just went along, 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 along this list. And I realized, and I think that's exactly what we're trying to do for the last 40 years. That's exactly what the New Testament says. It sounded all new because the church didn't look like that. So is God doing a new thing? Or is he trying to get us to do the thing that he's actually had in the first place? It looks new because we've got it so wrongly patterned and we've got it so wrongly wine-skinned and we're not drinking the wine that we're supposed to, the new wine from heaven. And, and you know what I'm saying, right? So, so and I thought, that's great. And, and we've got to rejoice when God is speaking to a completely different movement. I think, thank God that... The, the hearing, because it was all biblical. It was all in the Word. Um, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. But we are doing our best to build that way. And you, again, you've got to go against the culture. You know? um, as a result, it goes on to, because of these ministries, it says, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there way, by waves and carried about in every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. Every single person, by the way, not the apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, every believer speaks the truth in love. We are to grow up into all aspects into him is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body is fitted together, held together by that every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. Everyone's doing its work, causes growth, of the body for the building of itself in love. We've got to do it the biblical way and work the way God tells us to do it. Amen. A new wine can only go in a new wine skin, but I think as we get a revelation of the new wine, it adds revelation to be able to receive new wine. I think they're interconnected. I think that one is flows with the other. If I'm really going to receive the new wine, it's going to help my wine skin. 
if I allow it to. It's like the banks in the river in Ezekiel. You know the banks in the river? And the river flows from the throne. I, I picture the river as the life of God. Because some people see it as, oh, the river and the word, you know, the spirit and the word. And they're actually all, it's all, inter, it's, it's all connected. We separate it. You can preach the word and people be filled with the spirit. You can preach the word. You know, Jesus says, my words, they are spirit. They are life. There's a scripture that the word of Jesus, the words of God, carry spirit, carry the presence, carries faith, carries love, carries joy. Just words do, because words are carriers. And then there's a scripture in Ephesians um, 5. It says, by the washing of the water, water, by the word of God. The word of God is likened to water. So there's the river. It's the life of God. Or else we think that the word is, the, you, know, um, you know, are you a word or a spirit church? And there's river churches and there's word churches and all this sort of stuff. And actually just should be all one. So the banks does speak of like the wineskin. It, it carries. Now what's more important when it comes to the river, the banks or the river? Well, the both is important because if you don't have the banks, you've got a marsh. That's what the Bible says. It's a marsh. Where there's no banks, there was a marsh. And there's no life in the marsh. You actually have to have the banks to carry the river the life of God. But the banks speak of revelation, knowledge, doing things according to God's word, carries the river. So when I get the right revelation, it's going to aid the river. And when I get the river coming, it's going to aid the banks. It's going to help the banks to be healthy. But we need the life of God. Because sometimes our minds go, our oh, structure, wineskin, and we just think structure, elders, deacons, make sure they're qualified according to the Bible, which is all true, priesthood of all believers, these are structures and that. But you know, a part of the wineskin is the fact that in the book of Acts, they prayed re- continually. That's a part of a wineskin to me. I look at that and go, well, that, if we're not doing that, we're not part of the wineskin. And if they're humble and hungry and thirsty for God and they're seeking God and they're worshiping, that's a part of the wineskin. Because you can have everything in place and not have the presence of God. The whole point of the wineskin was to have the presence of God, to contain the presence. So we can have the right, we can have the gospel and then not trust God for miracles and signs and wonders because the gospel can, I think it captulates everything. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But salvation is every area of our life. Healing, emotional healing, deliverance, freedom from everything, freedom from addiction, freedom from sickness. It, it, the gospel carries the presence of God and salvation in all those areas. Hmm. You know, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, you, you, you know, 1 Chronicles 15, verse 12, you want to look it up. And, and you know the story when they moved the, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God and they moved it um, the practical way, the easy way. Um, you know, it's like put it on the cart, it'll, it'll get the job done. Put it on the cart. Maybe the Philistines did it that way and they just thought, you know, let's do it this way. It's going to be easy. It's not going to be so strenuous. It's not going to be hard, hard if we carry it. It's, it's a long way. It sounded good, sounded wise. It sounded natural wisdom. And it's like, this, let's do that. So they did it. And as, as the oxen stumbled, was it Uriah that touched it and the judgment hit him and he died. And, and, and David was quite angry and quite frustrated. And it was probably one of his close friends and he, and he didn't want to touch the ark for a long time. You know the story. And then he obviously started to seek God and realize why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did my friend die? Why did judgment hit? Like it, it, it was so important to God to do it the prescribed way that when David looked at it, he says in verse 13, it talks about, because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. The son of the Levites carried the ark of God and their sh- on their shoulders with the poles thereon, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So it was already revealed by Moses how they're supposed to do it. They just didn't check. And they assumed on God. And I believe it's happening worldwide. When we assume on God, we build our way, then judgment happens. It might take 20 years. Like a, a, an assumption is when we build on a personality of one person. That's still an, that's not a biblical pattern where the whole church is, is like, if it wasn't for that person's gift, that personality, that gifting, that, that, then sometimes they're highly gifted. That's gifted by God, but they're using it the wrong way. And eventually things crack. And, eventually, and if that person ever falls or goes off astray, it usually always empties the church. 
And if the person's away, the, ch- the church attendance is low. It, what is it? It's building on the person rather than biblical pattern. On Jesus Christ, the foundation. We, sh- we should be so grounded on Jesus that if our leader did, it would, it would grieve us for him, but it wouldn't shake our faith. Because we're not following a man, we're following Jesus Christ. But when we build the pro- in proper way, and we've seen this worldwide, even in our nation. And then they, they're scra- scrapling and then we need to find more accountability. I'm thinking, oh, this is a great time to ask questions. It's a great time to think, what's the biblical way? And, and you know, like when we have boards, I think boards are so unbiblical personally. To me, when you have a board and people are on your board that you're supposed to be accountable to, and they don't even come to your church. A lot of them don't. A lot of them are great business people, great men, great kingdom guys. But they don't even come to the church and they are making decisions of governance of that church. They don't even know the people. That's un- unbiblical. So in the long run, guess what? Judgment happens. It, takes, it might take some time, but cracks will form because we didn't do it God's way. So, you know, there's, there's, I, look at, I look at history and I, and I love revival and, I love, and, I, and I've studied it on many years ago, reading on Azusa Street, reading on a Welsh revival. You know, you're just hungry for a move of God to, to shake our city. And, and a lot of those moves are based on one person. And so God moves from that one person because of a hunger, because of faith, because they're seeking God. Obviously, they've got enough revelation to, and they encounter God and God uses them. You know, even Evan Roberts, young man, 22, 23 years old, but, but it lasted three or four years, whatever it was. And he burnt out because and, 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 it was built on one person. And so with other, other ones as well, the Zeus Street lasted four or five years. Why can't we have an ongoing revival where it's built on every single person rather than on one or two people? You know, I look at, I look at Pensacola Revival, if you know anything about that. John Kilpatrick, great pastor, and Stephen Hill, great evangelist, teaming up together, exploded a bit of a river that brought revival for three or four years, but it wasn't going to contain it because it's not the right biblical model. And you, I heard their testimony. They go, the only reason why it stopped is we got so tired. It was built on them. They, got, they said they were going to bed at three or four o'clock in the morning, sleep for two, three hours, and do it all over again. Five, six, seven days a week. And so we see great outpourings, and they're, 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 they're great. I think they stir up they, they've seen many fruits from it, and people get saved, and people uh, answer the call of God, and they're shaking the nations. And, you know, there's a lot of fruit from that, but we still want to be biblical, don't we? We still want to build the right way. You know, John Arnett and Randy Clark, there's a pastor, there's an evangelist working together. It just shows you the Bible. To me, it shows you how right the Bible is. Imagine what can happen with five-fold ministry working, partnering together. The right foundations being laid with the apostle, with the prophet foreseeing. You know, I, I, I just quickly, if you build biblically, you'll have Jesus as preeminent in your everything, in your everyday life, in your preaching, in your teaching, in your connect groups, in everything. Jesus is always spoken of. Jesus is why we do all that we do. But if you don't, the other side of not building biblically, you'll have a man made church. Or you'll have, sorry, Jesus has just added. Right? This is what happens when you do a man-made church. But uh, when you're building towards Jesus, everything is built towards Jesus. But if you've got a man-made church, you've got building towards yourself or, or disciples try to bring, uh, sorry, people try to bring disciples to themselves, even in the congregation. In the blueprint of the biblical one, you, got to d- you die to yourself. But in the other one, it's message of self-help. In, in the biblical one, it's equipping the saints in the man-made when it's tickling ears and tr- you need to entertain. And we can go on and on. In the biblical one, it's family. In the other one, it's business. It's company. It's like you run it like a, the world runs their business. Priesthood of all believers, hierarchy, only a few are anointed. Be in church everywhere 24-7. Wouldn't that be amazing? From doing church on Sunday. But being church. That's what biblical model is going to look like. Um, going and sending the biblical church the unbiblical one man-made is just gathering a crowd teamwork and body ministry you know the body of Christ one man show God's man or woman of power the gospel of the kingdom the gospel of salvation making disciples making decisions power authentic authority miracles positions and titles we can go on and on and on from that and I, I found something in the scriptures that I thought, oh, that is actually very interesting. And I, I think, I don't know why I haven't seen it before. But 1 Corinthians 12, 
when it, it, we haven't got time to read the whole thing, but 12 is Paul laying an argument about the body operating like the way our body operates, so it is with Christ. And he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, but he ends up with, you pick up from verse 27, he's still talking about this theme. He says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues, are all apostles. Now he's referring to body parts. In other words, saying the whole body can't be an apostle. It's still referring to the same teaching in that chapter. If you read it over and over in context, you actually realize, for me it's easily seen, he says, are all apostles. Are, are they? And the answer is no. All, all, sorry, all are not prophets. Are they? All are not teachers. Are they? All are not workers of miracles. Are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? In other words, every part has a particular function. And I realize, and I realize, and we know that Jesus is the head and we're the body. So the body of Christ. There's, there's been a great um, prophecy in the 70s. I tried, I tried to find it. I did find it before. It's about, it's about the sleeping giant. Have you heard of it? A sleeping giant is this powerful sleeping, this powerful giant, but he's asleep. That he's awakened. It's a symbolic picture of the church awaking around, around the nations. The, the sleeping giant wakes up and to, to be powerful to represent God as ambassadors of the king and preach the gospel of the kingdom with signs and wonders. The sleeping giants are waking. And I pictured this and I thought, if the body, if, if we're like the body and that's how we represent Christ, imagine if there's no apostolic ministry. In the 70s and 80s, there was not many apostles going around. Imagine if you never, and if apostles are, are, are the going people, they're the they're sending, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, the, they're supposed to be, means to send, to be sent, right? Imagine if the body of Christ had no apostles. You'd have, you'd be dis, um, disabled in this area because you can't walk. And imagine if um, the prophets weren't functioning, then the prophets probably could see and they, they, they see and now they're blind. The, body, the body's there. The body of Christ is functioning, but really can't see the way God wants them to see because the prophet's not operating properly. Imagine if the, past, uh, the, the pastor's like the hands and the hands on love and care. And, and imagine if I didn't have my hands operating. I can't do it to this hand. Imagine if the teacher was the ears and now I can't see, I can't hear, I can't move. And I, this is what the body of Christ has been for many, many decades in the past. But I believe God's opening up our eyes because the prophets are arising to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. God's opening up, getting our legs going and our hands going and our ears and the whole body functioning the way God wants it to. It's happening. We're living in these days that we should be excited because this prepares the bride for the groom. God's coming back for a perfect church without spot or wrinkle. And the church says to Jesus, Lord Jesus, come. And the church is going to rise up with this authority, with signs and wonders. And because, we're, because we're, the part of the wineskin is hunger, part of the wineskin is also humility and seeking God and say, God, we can't do nothing without you. So we, fi- we get filled with God. The p- part of the wineskin is the prayer culture. Because the book of Acts, they pray daily, daily in the temple and from house to house, they preach the gospel. They pray daily. Three o'clock in the afternoon was the time of prayer because it was like siesta time. But they, the church wasn't sleeping, they were praying. And so God's raising us up to know Him and the presence of God is going to flow for every nameless people. And miracles and signs and wonders will come through your hands but it will become very natural. It won't be, wow, it was just you pray for someone and they'll get healed. What's it going to look like? We've got to, we've got to, we, I don't, we have to expect it. We have to have faith for it. We have to dream it. We have to believe. If Jesus says the works that I do, shall you do also. We have to say, God, what's going to look like? Now, we, we uh, went somewhere and had a vision before I went to the meeting, a quick just picture in my mind was of a spinal cord, a spinal cord and a hole and a finger went into it. So that's weird. It's like... Hey, what do I do with that? What's that? So when I went to the meeting, it was the, the night before the meeting. When I went to the meeting, there was a lady that was crippled for 10 years. And so 
I shared that. I just thought it took me faithful and obey. And this is where God stirred me about power and power and power. Like God, you know, it's a part of the gospel. So we prayed for her and a lot of people went around and prayed for her. She didn't get up there and then, but I'm trusting that God will heal her because he has healed her. But what would it be like if she just got up? Ten years of not functioning from here down. That's what we've got to contend for because Jesus contended for that. Jesus moved with compassion. He healed the sick. And I believe we've got to, we've got to contend for signs and wonders Again, not for us, but for them. The fact that someone's crippled and they could be healed. I, I said, you know, anyway, hey, Lord, why did you show me that? Obviously, because he wants to heal. I'm just being vulnerable. I'm just saying this is what we've got to, we, we, we're trusting with God. We're believing God. We're saying, God, we want to see your power move in our land. What's it going to take to heal, to, to, to set a city free, to see a nation come to the Lord? I think it's going to be the signs and wonders of the early church. The miracles that Jesus walked in. Can we pray? Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just want to say thank you that you, through your wisdom and your divine revelation and knowledge and wisdom that you had it all worked out, put 66 books together so we could have a a divine pattern to work from. But Father, help us not just build with a pattern and then not have your presence. Father, we're hungry for your presence as a people. We open up our hearts and we, we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, has made a way for us to come into the very presence of our Father. And there's nothing in the way between us and you, Father. We have access to the Father by one Spirit. We give you glory, Lord. We give you praise right now. Your presence is here. Your glory is in us. This glory is in earthen treasure. Uh, uh, Sorry, uh, this treasure is in earthen vessels. We are the earthen vessels. The treasure of the glory is inside of us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So, Father, we just thank you that your glory is in us because of what Jesus did and died for so that we could be reunited with God. What does it look like to be reunited with God? That God's spirit is living inside of every one of us who are believers. That we are temples. We're actually mobile temples of the Holy Ghost. Everywhere we go, God is walking inside of us, with us. Mobile temples of the Holy Ghost. Father, we're hungry. We don't want to, stay. We don't want to ever be empty. We want to be full. They were refilled in the, Holy, in, the, in, the, in the book of Acts. They prayed and got refilled with the Holy Spirit. And Father, we want to be refilled tonight. We cry out to you, Father. Thank you for your awesome presence right now. Thank you, Father. Come in your glory. Come in your glory. Come in your glory, Lord. And Lord, it's not just about tonight that when we spend time with you alone, thank you for your glory. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your presence like never before every day of our life, Lord. Thank you, Father.